justice. So it's a very good read, um, and I think it's very much needed in the field of transitional justice, but conflict studies more broadly. Um, I think this book um, will have um, a big readership. So I will uh, leave it here. I will hand over to Fionnala uh, to, to guide us through the book um, and um, to tell us a bit more um, about the key findings and the reflections she had in the process of, of editing this book. So thanks for being here. Again. So thank you all for braving the snow. Um, I, I didn't, despite being surrounded by mountains, uh, it, I understand that Geneva does not get a lot of snow, which explains why so many people are stuck and cars are going hither and everywhere. Um, I, so I'm, thank you all for coming out for this event. Um, I particularly want to thank the Graduate Institute, uh, with whom I have had a very long uh, collaboration, uh, particularly with Thomas and Frank, Professors Hadelman and Unger, um, and my institute in Belfast has had, we've had a number of collaborations and discussions over the years, and so it's always really uh, fabulous to come here and feel like I have a home away from home, which is, which is always very nice, so thank you to you both. Um, so I'm really pleased to launch this book, and I want to say a couple of things about the substance of the book and the thematic issues that are addressed by the book, which I think is really relevant, particularly to the students who are in the master's uh, program and who have an interest in gender. Um, one of the things, books are like babies. They have usually a quite long birthing history. And so this book was conceived five years ago. <laughs> You're both laughing because they know it's true. Um, it, was, it was conceived five years ago. Um, all of the authors are scholars or practitioners. Uh, Nala Valji is, uh, uh, works in the Secretary General's office. And my two co-authors, Nomi Khan and Dina Hayes, are both scholars who work on issues of conflict and gender for many years. And we saw a significant gap in the field of um, conflict and gender studies. Um, in particular, what we saw was um, Dina and uh, Naomi and I had collaborated on a book about what happens to women in the aftermath of armed conflict. But what we were struck by at the time was the emphasis in most of the writing on gender and armed conflict is on women as victims, right? So there's an enormous literature and a lot of scholarly work that focuses on sexual violence in particular, but that there was really a gap around the kind of broader scope of uh, inquiry into the gendered experience of conflict. Um, the second thing we were really aware of uh, is that much of the writing is done by white women in the global north around women of color in the global south. And, um, and is mostly, mostly done by scholars who do not live in or have never experienced conflict. So I think that is both a pedagogical and a conceptual challenge to do this work when the people who are writing about it actually live in a very privileged position and don't have the direct experience of what it is like to live in a conflicted society, whether as a man or a woman. And so both Nala and I, Nala is South African and spent much of her life in apartheid South Africa and has the experience of coming through a conflict and a transition. And I obviously grew up in Belfast, Northern Ireland and have had a long uh, story engaged with that conflict and our current transition. Find a seat. Yeah, no, no, come, come, there's seats. Um, so our, one of our goals in writing this book was actually to bring together, so many of the contributors of, as, as um, Thomas rightly pointed out, um, are a little bit of a who's who, but there are also many diverse women and voices, and we made a particular commitment to having writers and scholars and practitioners from the Global South uh, work on this project. The other um, thing that drove it was the idea that, in fact, much of the writing is done by lawyers. And I'm a lawyer, so I shouldn't disparage lawyers. But actually, we, my, our view as editors was that a legal perspective alone on conflict is insufficient to address the complexities of conflict, to address how one escapes from or overcomes conflict, and how one does the long-term work of reconciliation or even just coexistence in a violent society. So we also made a commitment to interdisciplinary writing and interdisciplinary contributions. Um, and that's probably why the book took five years, because um, mostly we were asking uh, individuals who may not have the same kinds of resources as scholars and practitioners in the global north have when writing. And also we were asking a number of practitioners whose day-to-day -day life is extremely busy to, to write about their experiences. 
Uh, the final thing I just want to say about the process of writing the book is the cover. So I don't know, you have the flyer. Does everyone see the cover? So it took us longer to agree the cover than it did to write the foreword. <laughs> um, let me explain why. So we had numerous images, and we had a big debate. I'd be interested in your comments on whether this is the right cover. Uh, for some of my, so one of the challenges, this is a very interesting image, of course. It's a very feminine woman, in a way, by the nape of her neck and the length of her hair, wearing a military uniform. So on the one hand, you have this very uh, contradictory image on the front. Um, but equally, it pays attention to the kind of more militaristic aspects of the kind of gender and, conf and conflict interface which we debated a lot as to whether that was the image we wanted to have, because the book tries to address a broader range of issues, not simply the militarized masculinities of conflict. So anyway, the book cover itself was a protracted discussion, and we can talk more about that. So let me go to the substance of what the sort of intellectual space that the book engages. So it's very clear that in the last, particularly the last two decades since the end of the Cold War, that the differing and overlapping experiences of men and women in situations of armed conflict has garnered a great deal of attention. And that, I think, that attention to men's and women's experiences, but particularly women's experiences, uh, comes from four things. And the first of these is the one that I've already mentioned, which is that there is much more attention and greater visibility to the violations, particularly the sexual violations experienced by women in time of war. Um, the second is that in a number of very high profile incidents and I, uh, or instances, and I include probably Afghanistan as perhaps the most high profile of these, the focus on gender violations was a basis for some states for justifying their humanitarian or their military intervention. And um, the third factor, I think, has been the exposure of a much greater effect of socio-economic and cultural effects on women as a result of war and armed conflict. And finally, I think, and this is maybe the least, but in some ways possibly an increasingly important um, a factor, is that there's a deepening awareness of the vulnerability of and the costs for men of engaging in war. And that is a relatively new and unexplored space. And so the growing visibility because of these kind of, if you want, spaces um, has enhanced particularly media t attention to what happens uh, to women in war. And that has had a resulting impact on policy um, and institutional attention. Um, but I think one of the challenges of the book, in a way, is to really try to open up and give greater attention and visibility to those issues that have not been addressed. And so let me first of all talk about gender. So the book is called not the Handbook of Women and War, but the Handbook of Gender and War. And so this is interesting because often when the word gender is used, what people assume it means is women, right? That gender is sort of elided with women. So what happens then is that the word is conflated uh, leaving men as the kind of default unmarked category and all of our attention goes when we talk about gender to talking about women. And so one of the things that this handbook tries to do is to address the totality of gendered experiences of armed conflict and in particular to look at the cross-cutting effects of, on both women and men of armed conflict. And that's actually quite hard to do, and those of any of the folks in the room working on the policy space of armed conflict, increasingly when you use the word gender, even when it's used in Security Council resolutions, it's kind of red code for women. And while it is absolutely true that we need to substantively address the experiences of women in warfare, not just as victims, but also as perpetrators, as combatants, as active engagers in, the, in, the, in this normative space. I think what we also are increasingly aware of is that we have to address the particular experiences and vulnerabilities <coughs> of men in war. And what do I mean by this? I think what we mean by this is exploring the vulnerability of men, in particular that men are often presumed combatants, even if they are in fact civilians. And one of our greatest challenges in the area of civilian protection, 
it seems to me from a gender perspective these days, is that men, particularly young men between the ages of 16, 17, sometimes younger, are presumed combatants <coughs> even when they are not. Vacating the combatants, vacating the civilian space from male protection and assuming that that space of protection is one word, women and children, right? Not just, not women and children, but like a one word default. And so understanding the vulnerability of men, both in terms of the presumptions that go to male behavior in, in, in conflict, um, but also male role during and after conflict is absolutely essential to addressing both the causalities of war, understanding in particular what mobilizes and prompts men to engage in armed conflict or violence, but also figuring out better how it is that we translate male experiences of conflict when we come out of armed conflict. And so this is particularly true in the DDR space, in the, in the space of trying to rehabilitate combatants back to ordinary life, in which the experiences of formative masculinities, men's experiences of what it means to be a man, is shaped profoundly by their experience of warfare, making the translation back to civilian life much more difficult. It is also the case that we are increasingly aware of the violence experienced by men in war. And I don't just mean the violence experienced as combatants, but also the the violence is experiences by men, particularly in the area of sexual violence. And so even as we recognize that it has been extraordinarily difficult for women to expose and to talk about the harms that they've experienced um, during armed conflict, we have to stop, pause and understand that when a man experiences sexual violence in war, that the capacity of men to even articulate that harm is even further limited in societies where the idea of sexual violence against a man is, is often conflated with the criminalization of sodomy, right? which means that those men, even if they acknowledge that they've experienced sexual violence, will be persecuted for a crime rather than seen as victims. Um, so that opening up that space of discussion to see gender as including both men and women is really one of the important projects that this book engages. Um, but it is also true that we recognize that for centuries, women exper women's experience of warfare has been ignored and marginalized and silenced. And so one of the very first steps that a feminist scholar, and all four of us are feminist scholars, take when we started this book was to look for the silences. And let me first start with the regulatory framework of armed conflict, which this book addresses at some length in a, uh, both Judith Gardam and a number of other contributors address the law of armed conflict. And the book starts from the presumption that the law of armed conflict is deeply gendered and that it was primarily structured to, exp to express or to regulate the challenges and the experiences of male combatants when they were engaged in structured hostilities with one another. So when we look at the early laws of armed conflict, going back to the Geneva Law of the 1950s, the Lieber Code, the Hague Regulations, the Geneva Conventions of 1949, the additional protocols to the Geneva Conventions, the focus of, on women was minimal. And um, where women were viewed at all in these rules that framed the regulation of war, it was primarily as victims of conflict. And the operative phrase that emerges in all of those treaties is the notion of honor, right? So when we, when we track through these treaties that regulate armed conflict and we look at where do women appear, they appeared through this code word of honor. And that word is particularly important because when these treaties were constructed and including the most recent treaties, the additional protocols of 1977, the honor in question was not the autonomous rights bearing honor of the woman. It was the honor of the man to whom she was attached, either her father, her brother, her husband, her son. And so it's their honor and dignity that is protected by the law of armed conflict, by IHL, not the autonomous rights of women. And so that, that's evidenced in a number of ways. First, it's only relatively recently that the crime of rape has been formally included as a breach of the laws of war. 
And beyond the crime of rape, the panoply of harms that women experience in armed conflict, uh, whether it's enforced pregnancy, uh, whether it's enforced abortion or sterilization, whether it's other forms of indignities, including trafficking, the vocabulary for those harms was almost entirely absent in the vocabulary of international law until the end of the Second World War. And so it's also clear that the normative framework that, ex that regulates the experience of harm for women in war is a normative framework that has lacked a vocabulary. And we are, as the book tracks, sort of constantly rushing to fill those gaps and trying to actually expand the vocabulary of harm that exists under the law of armed conflict. And so the book explores what that vocabulary of harm involves, what, how it has expanded, and some of the normative challenges that have arisen both for courts and for enforcers of the law in actually making those harms both meaningful and visible. Um, now, some of that work has been done by the fact that a number of conflicts which took place at the end of the Cold War, and in particular, the conflict that took place in the former Yugoslavia, has lent an enormous visibility to women's experiences of harm. But I think we also have to be very critical and in some ways skeptical of how that process has unfolded. So it's not the case as the book, there's a particular chapter on, on, on the experience of Bosnia-Herzegovina, it is not the case that widespread rape and war was first experienced in the Yugoslav conflict. But let us be clear that that was happening on the territory of Europe and to mostly white women. And so it was hyper visible to external communities, but the systematic rape that took place in numerous conflicts throughout the 60s, 70s, and 80s were simply rendered invisible because it was happening to women who were, broadly speaking, invisible and who did not have the power to be seen. And so as the chapter on Rwanda in the book addresses, it's also clear that the emphasis on systematic violence against women in the Rwandese conflict didn't happen by accident. It happened because the Rwandese conflict happened right after that conflict in which white women were being uh, made more visible. And there was a certain incongruity in not noticing that this was also happening to women of color. Um, so another very important point that comes out of this book is that the experience of widespread sexual and other harm to women in war is not a contemporary phenomenon, despite the uh, kind of coverage we get, but that it has a very long history, and the history has been a history of impunity. And so we have a number of interesting chapters, for example, on sexual violence in antiquity, going through from the Roman and Greek period and tracing the kind of genealogy of sexual violence as a method and means of warfare over centuries, uh, whose logic was precisely intended to advance the military and strategic interests of states. Um, so that's violence, and I, there's a lot more to say about that, and I'm happy to answer questions about it. But let me now focus on a second strain of advocacy or work around women and war that the book has a kind of a a big focus on, which is the emergence in 2000 of a new, if you want, agenda within the UN system on uh, women and conflict. And that is the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, which was passed by that landmark resolution 1325 um, at the Security Council. And so one of the shifts that the book traces is that this early post-Cold -war, uh, War emphasis on sexual violence uh, particularly through these very high profile conflicts, has in some sense been replaced by this emphasis on a women, peace and security agenda. And what we got from about 2000 onwards was a series of high profile Security Council resolutions which were actively lobbied for by a transnational feminist network to put gender on the Security Council's agenda. <laughs> And there's a whole set of really interesting stories in the book from some of the primary actors, the women who were the key, if you want, uh, norm entrepreneurs who were involved in creating those resolutions, talking about how they thought that was going to go down and what actually happened. So 
we look at the original uh, resolution, 1325, uh, that resolution had a really wide focus. It focused on the prevention of violence to women. It focused on gender equality in the broadest sense. And it focused on women's participation in all spheres of peacemaking and security decision making. So if you were a betting woman, as that resolution was passed, which was broad and wide in many ways, you would want to, if you were optimistic, assume that all of these aspects of this resolution would get equal play. But actually what happened in practice was that one very particular piece of the WPS agenda took on a life of its own. Anybody know what that was without, re without reading the book? Now, I wish it were participation. Violence, violence sexual violence, actually. Yeah, so that one of the kind of landmark experiences of this resolution was that despite the fact that it was a wide-ranging resolution that sought to address these conditions that produced the violence, the emphasis in the Security Council became highly focused on sexual violence. And what we got was a series of resolutions, uh, 1820 in 2008, 1888 in 2009, 1960 in 2010, uh, 2106 in 2013, 2122 in 2013, and 2242 in 2015. And the predominant focus of most of those resolutions was sexual violence. And don't get me wrong, the book, its editors, myself included, it is not that we do not think that we should not be focused on sexual violence. But there is something quite startling that it is the fact of sexual violence where most of the heat of international attention goes. And so this sort of, this, and that is a very complex relationship which a number of our contributors and our, 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 our editorial essay captures this sense that while focus on sexual, this focus on sexual violence in some ways has the effect of both infantilizing and victimizing women only in conflict. And what you fail to get is a consistent policy focused attention to the vulnerabilities that produce that violence as well as seeing the broader scope of actions that women engage in. And this space, as the book argues, is a very comfortable space, state, place for states. Because actually states get to look like they're protecting women from sexual violence without ever committing to doing the hard work that would address the gender equality that might prevent the violence happening in the first place, right? So this sort of purient interest with sexual violence is one that is my own work has um, addressed fairly substantially and is addressed in a number of respects in the, um, in the, in the discussion of the book on the WPS agenda. Um, so this broader challenge, which is emphasized in, uh, in uh, last year, no, it was the year before, we had the 15 year anniversary of the WPS agenda. And that, that anniversary produced a global study, and the author of the global study is, is included in the handbook. And the idea of the global study was to bring together fresh policy attention from states and from international institutions on really undoing this sort of narrowing of the women, peace, and security space to try to recapture the energy of the first resolution so that we would once again focus on these broader issues. Um, and the resolution made clear that you had to do this broader work in order to effectively address the experiences of women and men in conflict. So it's very interesting, and the, the book documents this, at the, at, the, at the anniversary there was a Security Council meeting and it's the longest, believe it or not, it's the longest Security Council debate in history. There were, it ran for eight and a half hours plus. There were more speakers than, I, I forget the numbers, but there were more states wishing to speak on this resolution than on the bombing of Syria. So don't get me wrong, on the one hand, this is a positive step to have states stepping up to speak about gender. But on the other hand, if you're, skeptical, if you're a skeptical feminist like I am, you have to be very worried when a group of men are really you know, standing up and saying how interested they are in protecting women's rights, right? So that resolution, that meeting, produced a new Security Council resolution, 2242. It's a resolution that's actually 
pretty important for my own mandate because this is the first resolution in which the, U the UN Security Council committed states to addressing gender in the context of terrorism and counterterrorism and preventing violent extremism. And as my, as the contribution, we have a contribution from two of the gender and counterterrorism experts in the book. As that contribution acknowledges, on the one hand, this is apparently a positive move where we see an engagement with one of the most salient aspects of contemporary conflict experience for women is happening in counterterrorism spaces. But we also have to be deeply skeptical when women are being used as the front line of engaging and countering terrorism. And as my own work as Special Rapporteur um, has acknowledged, one of the dangers here is we securitize women. Uh, one of the things we see in a number of national strategies around counterterrorism is that women, primarily in the area of preventing and countering terrorism, are supposed to be the front line of preventing their sons and their husbands and their brothers going off to fight. So we take the group which is often the least powerful, both in terms of family dynamics or community dynamics, and invest them with the responsibility of preventing violent extremism. And so this particular move, I think, is a very uh, problematic one um, and highlights some of the broader challenges of the WPS agenda. The final piece that, that I want to focus on before I, I, I pause is to say that the other important and very under-recognized piece of women's engagement in gender and conflict is twofold. One is women, women's involvement in peacemaking. So in numerous places across the globe, including the place where I come from in Northern Ireland, women were historically throughout the conflict absolutely central to creating the kinds of relationships across community, across sectarian lines, that enabled the peace process to be concluded successfully. And that's in part because, for a whole variety of reasons, without essentializing women's experiences, there was a capacity to do this kind of broader connecting on a range of issues. So, for example, in Northern Ireland through the conflict, um, and we have a contribution by two of the leading, one of the women who was involved in negotiating the peace agreement, Monica McWilliams, um, and, uh, and uh, Avla Kilmurray. They were both members of the negotiating team that signed and ratified the agreement. Um, one of the things that happened was that women co op so on very simple things, like the provision of childcare, it really doesn't matter if you're a Protestant woman or a Catholic woman. Your, ch your child needs childcare. And it really doesn't matter if you're a Protestant woman or a Catholic woman and you're experiencing domestic violence. You need a functional set of shelters across cities and towns that enable you to be safe. So there were these, if you want, issues that, were, that cut across the conflict that enabled these relationships to be built that allowed a degree of capacity that simply didn't exist in many other parts of the sort of civil society. And so it's the harnessing of that experience into peace processes that has been critical. And so the book explores in a number of ways the kinds of engagements that women's participation in peace processes have had and the continued resistance by primarily male actors to the inclusion of women and in particular civil society women activists in peace agreement negotiation. And that's always really interesting, that resistance, what it speaks to. The final piece of that, of course, is that women are not always or essentially peaceful. And we do not live in violent societies without women engaging in violence. And so one of the offshoots of this emphasis on sexual violence and victimhood or on the essentialization of women as essentially peaceful and essentially good at making peace agreements is we ignore the reality that we have women perpetrators of violence, we have women combatants, we have women terrorists, we have women who mother violently. We have women who do many things that don't fit with an essentialist view of, of what it means to be a woman in a conflict. And so we have a number of contributions in the book that directly address the role of women as perpetrators of violence and women as combatants. And I think that engagement with the variety of roles that women play in armed conflict is really important to getting us out of the sort of the, the mind frame that thinks of women as essentially peaceful and men as essentially violent, because the two are often 
not, not true. Um, but it also allows us to engage with the complexity of making peace in societies where if we only presume that it is the men doing the violence, the solutions to engaging reconciliation or coexistence have these gender fault lines that are actually highly problematic and are in themselves a barrier to understanding the complexity of how violent, violence is produced and reproduced in a society. So I hope some of you will read the book. Um, I hope some of you will do uh, some more work on this issue. And it remains, gender and conflict remains a highly relevant and highly under-researched and under-theorized area of, of law, policy, and practice. So thank you for listening. Dear Professor Yolaine, dear Fionnella, thank you so much for sharing with us these really inspiring ideas, I think, about a topic which often, I think you said it rightly, is dominated by cliches, things taken for granted, and also going beyond, I think, those, those um, cliches. It's, I think it's a very good contribution, and I'm sure that many people now will rush to the library or <laughs> buy the book and, and get familiar with um, all the interesting contributions. So now I think um, it's the time for questions and answers. Sure. I would like to kick off, so to say, with a very transitional justice kind of question, since you are, have many of the masters, so <laughs> I do so. And the question is the following. Um, I was wondering, if you take a view of gender as you take, if you take gender seriously, right. and you think this should be part of the debate, right. is the transitional justice framework as we know it, as it, with the four pillars and so on, but as it is practice, is it good enough? Is, can, it be, can it be adapted? Is it, or mm -hmm. must, it, must it be radically reformed and redone? Right. Uh, so that's my question. And if we just adapt it a little bit, don't we run the risk of you know, doing things which are appreciated, huh? things mm -hmm. which are um, mainstream, but do we really go to the, the core things if we, if we just yeah. stay at, on the surface, I should say? That's yeah. Thank you. So, I mean, we have had a long discussion, <laughs> the three of us, about the framework and its adequacy. Um, I, I will say that I think a number of feminist scholars, myself included, <clears throat> have challenged the neutrality of the framework. So, starting with justice. I mean, historically, the emphasis on justice was on a presumption that there were no gaps, right? And so part of the post-Cold War emphasis on gender justice, whether it was at the ICTY or the ICTR and now at the ICC, was about, first of all, benchmarking these crimes. Like, when the, when the statute for the former Yugoslavia was first drafted, it had no gender crimes in it. The initial draft that was produced had no gender crimes. The assumption was that you drew on the law of armed conflict, so then you, why would you need to do anything else? And that left the, and the idea that you would have to interpret in these crimes into the existing framework, or they wouldn't be dealt with at all. And so the sort of understanding that there were these gaps meant that the justice piece literally needed to be written, right? Because we didn't have crimes like enforced prostitution or forced marriage. That in 19, as, the, as, these, as, these, as these conflicts erupted, those concepts didn't exist in law. We had to create those concepts. So on the justice piece, of course, we've had to do this hard work of gendering the justice pillar. The same is true of the truth pillar. So there's been a great deal of work done, starting with the South African TRC, recognizing that, for example, when the, when the, when the commission was established, women activists in South Africa had to press for gender justice hearings, right? Because there was no articulation that there was a particularly gendered experience of the of the, um, and what we know in my own work on truth and reconciliation, particularly on truth, has been, generally speaking, statistically, it's mostly men who show up to truth commissions. And when women show up, they talk about harms to men. They talk about harms to their husbands and their children. But they very rarely talk about harms to themselves. So again, we've had to do this incredible work, perhaps best illustrated by the Peruvian TRC, that sought from the beginning to essentially hardwire in gender justice, including training the commissioners of the, com of the commission to know how to do just gender justice, because most of them didn't. right? And 
Reparations is another obvious one where we've talked about the limits of reparation generally, but also in your own writing, Frank, is in sort of in theories of recognition. The question as to whether recognition is equally gendered is based on these gendered histories of what is a harm and what is not a harm. And in the context of judicial of guarantees of non-repetition, bearing in mind that when these when these harms are not articulated as crimes in the first place, how can you guarantee the non-repetition of something that has not yet even been called a harm? So I feel we've done a great deal of work, but I think we have a very long way to go. Actually, yeah, yeah. yeah very good. So let's start the discussion. Open the floor. Are there questions? I hope so many. Go. Yes, um, I was uh, recently reading, especially in terms of masculinities, yeah. and this kind of, uh, I thought it was very interesting and true that there has been a tendency over time with some studies to kind of essentialize yep. what men are and say, yep. okay, men are this way, but what if they don't fall into that process? Right. But I was also interested mm -hmm. in the way that we study it in terms of methodology. So we have men's studies and we have all the feminist studies. Right. And this kind of, the feminist studies in general has this power structure. So this understanding of there's politics yeah. at the end of it. Right. And I, I remember reading about the men's studies a little bit more going into the psychologi psychologic effect yeah. about uh, the problem of masculinity that we overlooked. My question was pretty much uh, through your experience. Uh, what did you do? You feel that there is this tension, and uh, whether mm -hmm. in feminist scholarship right. or these yeah. things, I would I would be very interested in knowing where yeah. the debate is there. Yeah, so we have a couple of contributors. So Chris Dolan, if any of you who are working on issues of gender violence should read Chris Dolan's work. Chris runs the uh, Refugee Law Center at Makare University in Uganda and has worked extensively with male victims of sexual violence in the Ugandan conflict. And he is one of the few folks who has started to theorize what that experience of vulnerability and, and harm is for men. Because the question is, it, we start from a very simple, is the harm the same? How are we to understand what the nature of that harm is? And that also requires an understanding of the construction of masculinity in society. So the tension I see, for example, is that on the one hand, for men, the harm, so Chris reports, and it's a very interesting chapter, that for a number of the men he works with, the harm is being made feel like a woman. It's a very complicated idea that the harm is to be feminized. So on the one hand, if we acknowledge that harm, that there is a harm in being feminized, as feminists, we undermine the position that we take of femininity itself as a kind of enforced harm, right? So that's a very complicated idea, that the harm itself involves the status that is the status that feminists are trying to elevate or value. So that's one very clear point of tension. Um, the second, then, is if there is a harm, thinking about it in this way, is the remedy to reconstruct masculinity? So if there's a masculine harm, by the perpetration of certain kinds of violence against men, what's the remedy? Is the remedy to reinstate the system that gives men a particular value in a society, often at the expense of women? So actually, I think there are enormous both conceptual and practical problems that follow from even kind of really digging into what the nature of the harm is. I do think for many feminists, and we see this particularly at the United Nations in the context of the various um, uh, high-level initiatives, that as scholars and practitioners working with men have argued to include men into the space, many feminist practitioners and scholars will say, we can't let that happen because it's, we've worked so hard to create the space of recognition for women that if we just say it's everybody's equally harmed, that men are also harmed, we lose both the policy space and the little bit of, sort of financial and other supports that exist for women. So I think the tension exists conceptually. I also think it exists in the practicality of what kinds of um, supports and material uh, material remedies are available. And I, I think we are very much at the start of navigating that space. Yeah. yeah. There was a question here. Yeah. 
Uh, first of all, thank you for the for today. It was very interesting, and I would like to ask. Every time I read about feminism, uh -huh. I find that there is like a tendency to hide that feminism is not a. Um, there's no one feminism. There are many ways of understanding feminism, and this is not bad. But uh, what I read, what I feel is that uh, there is a tendency to hide it because divisions in uh, uh, discriminate groups tend to be a weakness, no? Yeah, and this is right. depicted like that. So I would like to know how these different understandings of feminism right. affects uh, right. women in, in, in conflict. Yeah, so it's a very good question. And I think one of the challenges is the question of acknowledging multiple feminisms. For some feminists, that's a plus. So we think about the kind of variety of feminist discourses that there isn't a singular feminism. For others, it's a weakness, right? Because obviously, feminism is an analysis that at its heart is about challenging power. And if you have different understandings of how power functions and how you challenge power, then your capacity to challenge is weakened. I think one of the major critiques by a number of our non-Western contributors is that there's a particular brand of Western feminism, equality feminism, that assumes a certain set of priorities that are not shared by women across the globe. And so let me give you an example of that. In societies, for example, in, in a number of Western states, just to, to be a little bit essentialist, the emphasis on reproductive rights has been on the right to abortion. But in societies where women have been denied the right, particularly women of color, minority women, indigenous women, who have been denied the right to reproduce, for them, the issue is not a right to abortion. It's the right to reproduce, right? And if we can't understand the, those two ideas sitting together within a feminist framework, we actually under, undermine the sort of validity of the claim that's being made on rights. So I think we see it through a number of sub-issues. And it's also interesting, I think, another big schism is around the gap between civil and political rights and economic, social, and cultural rights. So we have consistently seen a tendency by mostly Western-based feminists to focus on harms to the body, physical harms to the body. Hence, in some ways, the primacy of rape and sexual violence in feminist discourses. But in many societies, the issue is not simply about harm to the body. It's about, can you feed your children? Do you have a right to health? Can you get clean water? Uh, can you prevent displacement? These are not physical. These are not I mean, they implicate um, civil and political rights, but they're primarily about harms of socioeconomic rights. And so we again see this significant split between different feminists and feminist positionality. And I think there's an increasing awareness that the emphasis on civil and political rights alone is simply inadequate. And in conflict, that matters enormously. Because when there have been some very interesting studies, and, and um, Thomas knows, I think, because I think Pablo used some of these studies for the work on, of the Special Rapporteur, that when you ask victim communities in the aftermath of violence what they want, often it's not accountability. What they want is clean water and a house and access to the most basic socioeconomic rights available, because these are the things that have been taken away. And so I think we, we have to be very careful as to thinking about who speaks for who and what claims are being made on the basis of, but that they're not really being made from those who experience the harm. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, very interesting. I noted uh, you uh, explaining how um, when you were doing this, uh, when you were writing the book and uh, doing the work, you noted how much, uh, much of the work was from the privilege global south yeah. and so little efforts were made to get uh, to work where people where it was from the global north and little efforts to work with people from the global south. I don't know in your experience I'm trying to understand because what happens okay from my observation in civil society the opposite is true uh, when you get a lot of reports a lot of uh, testimony what brings the funding it's because you have engaged the global south the yeah. underprivileged woman. She's on the forefront on a documentary you have done and so forth. Right. And it means that the people with resources and finances have sought out those right. uh, who are in that position. Is there no political will then to give them to the forefront right. of any academic work? Because 
I can't reconcile the two because mm -hmm. I never see, in most cases, the uh, woman from uh, the northern privilege being in a documentary. I always see a woman of color, right. a woman from a different background, and right. I'm also in an uh, in academic being a master's student. Right. So I know also that there are educated women of color who can also speak about their experiences, and right. they've spoken in documentaries, right. but when it comes to the academic work, the other work, they are excluded. Right. I don't know, what's your experience in that? So it's a complicated question, and um, uh, you know, uh, in this sense. Um, I think if we look literally at the relationships of representation, right, who represents, it is very clear that there are funding and other policy imperatives that demand the, the, the engagement with or use of or presence in sites of conflict in order to get, so we're talking about primarily conflict sites, uh, in order to engage the resources that are necessary. And there's this very complex relationship of commodification, right, where the funders understand, but the shaping of what are the priorities are shaped by funders and policymakers in the global north, and then co-opting in uh, those who are being funded or supported in the global south without there being any real equality around shaping what the agenda is. And we find this, those of you who've worked in the aid space know this all too well, that the reality is that you're, set, you're, you're, and we see this with women's organizations, the best example I can give you is on countering and preventing violent extremism, where we see enormous amounts of funding shaping that, that space, and women's organizations understanding that their access to funding is significantly dependent on framing themselves as doing that kind of work. How you recalibrate that relationship of inequality is extremely difficult, but what I would also say is I see enormous resistance by NGOs and others and civil society actors in the global south where they recognize they're being commodified and are actually shaping in, in ways that are resilient what's being done to them, right? And then often it's done in a very, um, in, I mean, in a very, uh, sophisticated way where you look like you're engaging but actually you're trying to reshape your agenda in your own way in your own space because I think it's also problematic if we suggest that the recipients in let's say the global south or in situations of conflict like the one I've spent most of my life in don't exercise agency also it's a it, there's a very interesting relationship in terms of academia the reality is and we a number of our contributors are scholars from the Global South, but they're working in the Global North. And the reason is, as you know, that universities in the Global South in many countries are systematically underfunded. Scholars will not have the chance to do the kind of writing and research they want to do. They'll be asked to teach. This is also increasingly true of the Global North, as it is commodified in other ways. But that the space for uh, academic work and reflection is not valued by governments, and it's not seen as part of the state's obligation to help create a healthy civil society. This is a much more complex story about what's happening to higher education across the globe, to which I don't have a good answer. Um, except to say that the more we raise the awareness of the lack of diversity in the production of knowledge, the more we put that question on the agenda. Yeah. Yes. Um. I'm a firm believer in gender fluidity, yeah. and uh, and I think it's very relevant how gender is a social construction or a cultural construction, yeah. and how that interacts with the conflict itself. Yeah. Uh, the question that I would go to is, how do you redress those cultural conceptions of gender that have nurtured conflicts? How do you redress that those things that are happening, should we just wait until the people that believe that die? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but how then, do we change their conception? But then there, yeah, yeah. No, no, it's a really good. So one of the gaps in the book is very interesting you ask this question. So we do have a, a one of the leading scholars who looks on, on issues of um, LGBTQI rights in the context of transition, Pasha Bueno-Hansen, who's a young Peruvian scholar who's been writing on these issues, writes 
about actually the problem in transitional justice of a lack of gender fluidity, even in... So she's criticizing feminists like me, rightly so, who have focused primarily on gender binary analysis and not looked at the broader landscape of gender fluidity. So I think that is a... And, and it's one of the things the editors noted, we note in our inter, inter introduction that we're also shaped by the kind of doctrinal and theoretical way that we come into this, this, the field. Um, so I think it's a, it's a significant challenge. And um, even as there's resistance to talking about gender in context of conflict, talking about gender fluidity with governments is <laughs> it's a very interesting and complicated space, is all I will say. Um, and of course, the arguments there are really arguments that you know, we, we come back to a cyclical conversation about cultural relativism and the specificity of particular kinds of cultural understandings of gender. And that has, has been and remains enormously powerful in the political and legal discourses that shape how we address these problems. You are right that one of the really, so one of the contributions in the book is by a, a, a Colombian American scholar called Kimberly Tyden who works a lot, she spent 20 years living with the Shining Path as a, she's an anthropologist and spent most of her field, she spent literally 20 years living and working with Shining Path communities in Peru. And Kimberly's observations as an anthropologist on how particularly she focuses on, on how male identities are constructed, right? And as a result, female identities too, that literally the making of a man in a particular society is so interconnected with particular ways of being, around having access to a gun, around having a particular way of expressing emotion, so boys don't cry, or boys don't, so that of course, when you are faced with a male combatant who's 25 years old, who spent the last 10 years on his whole life understanding what it means to be a man in a particular way, the fact that you take away his weapon, is not that's not decommissioning. You've taken away the external manifestation of his status as a combatant. But his entire being is a structure of combatancy that, is, that, isn't, that doesn't require a gun, right? And so the challenge is then, in the context of talking about DDR in particular, how do we address DDR as not simply a question of like taking away guns? How do we reconstruct masculinities? And what do we know about peace agreements? The data tells us that most peace agreements fail. The average lifespan of a peace agreement is five years, according to the database I run with a colleague in Belfast, the peace agreements database. So we're very good at taking away the material weaponry, but actually one of the reasons as a scholar of, of gender, I would say that we haven't managed to kind of move that number is the weapons alone don't explain the internalization of violence within a society and the ways in which that then reproduces cycles of violence. I don't have a good solution. I think we see some very interesting attempts to address that issue in micro form but it's extremely limited, and for as long as states don't recognize the centrality of gender structure to the production of violence, I think we're a very long way off looking at the causes that produce violence in a meaningful way. I think we we're running stop. out of time. <laughs> so thank you so much, Colonna, for sharing your ideas with us, for this beautiful discussion, and uh, I hope there will be another time to Me meet too. again. Yes, <laughs> thank you. I think you're wrong with saying that you're listening because I think you're wrong.